In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious Father, thank you for this day. Open our hearts and minds to see ourselves in relation to Christ as a band of brothers and sisters, not only here on earth, but in the world to come. And help us to see the sin of unbelief, the only truly unforgivable sin, and how it creeps up on us, uh, often without our knowledge and help us to remain on the path of light. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so Hebrews 3. Uh, we didn't quite finish Hebrews 3, 1 through 6 last time, and we're going to continue through the rest of the chapter. And again, I'm only going to be covering the section of Hebrews that is in the lectionary, that is, the sections of Hebrews that is going to show up as a reading sometime in church. Uh, throughout the, both the one-year and the three-year lectionaries. Uh, it still hits most of the book, but not all of it. Uh, for example, this first section of Hebrews 3, Hebrews 3, 1 to 6, is the uh, epistle reading for transfiguration uh, during year C, so that would be next year's transfiguration epistle reading. And then the latter part of the chapter is uh, one of the Sundays after Pentecost, it's proper 23 uh, from this year, so we'll hear it later this summer. Um, so Pentecost 23, that's going to be like two months before the end of the church year, month before the end of the church year, before uh, Advent. So so it's good to keep in mind, what is this read in church for? What are we supposed to be thinking of? So this first section, Transfiguration. So keep that in mind, these first six verses. It's read at Transfiguration Sunday. I'll go ahead and read the chapter tonight. I'm going uh, King James on us tonight. Okay. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our possession, our, our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by a foreman, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost, uh, wherefore, as the Holy Ghost says, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with this generation and said, they do, away, error in, they do always error in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. <clears throat> Take heed, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in the departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any one of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin." For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that he should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Okay, so there's, there's a lot going on in there. So let's see what we can make of it. Okay, so this, this next section of Hebrews we're starting from chapter 3 through uh, about halfway through chapter 5 is a section, if you wanted to label it something, you could call it the faithful and merciful high priest. Uh, and it's going to alternate now between uh, matters of doctrine. It's going to talk about doctrinal things. 
And then it's also going to use this fancy uh, theology term called paranetic. So it alternates between doctrinal statements and paranetic statements. And what paranetic means is a rhetorical uh, device where you give advice of an appropriate course of action. So you'll have doctrine, and then you'll get suggestions of how do we live this? How does that apply to us? Keeping in mind, again, this entire book of Hebrews is a sermon. So the preacher is going to give us some doctrine, and then he's going to give us uh, a life application. So chapter 3, verse 1, summarizes the whole preceding section that we've done up to now, chapters 1 and 2. So Jesus is the Son, sent by God as God's spokesman, and he is also our great high priest who sanctifies his brothers and sets up the section we just read as Jesus as the anointed Son who is set over God's house. And now this is the first time that the preacher, and I'm going to, call, I'm going to keep calling the author of Hebrews the preacher, because that's what he is, whoever he is. Okay, So the, this is the first time the preacher is directly addressing the congregation or the hearers. And he calls them holy brothers. Right? So they are sharing in the priestly holiness of Christ because we share Christ's sonship. And we, the preacher has taken us through that in the preceding sections. And we are also partaking of a heavenly calling because Christ shared in our flesh and blood. Therefore, our flesh and blood will be able to enter you know, the new earth when, it, when that comes. So we get to share in everything that is Christ's because Christ shared in everything that is us. Okay, so then we share in Christ's work as God's anointed son. So Christ is the anointed son of God, and we participate in that sonship as well uh, through the Lord's Supper, among other things. So we can actually call ourselves little Christ's with a lowercase c because we are little anointed ones. You know, we've been anointed into Jesus' death and resurrection. And it's a heavenly calling because God calls us to participate in it, calls us to believe in his son. And since our, our status and our vocation comes from Christ, the preacher is now going to tell us to consider Christ with eyes of faith. You know, we've kind of, to this point, have looked at Christ with eyes of the world, things we can see, the account of his life we can read. We read what Jesus did, all the things that he did in his life. So that's kind of knowledge, head knowledge, which is great. We have to have that knowledge, but that doesn't save us. It's believing why he did it is the reason we are saved. So now the preacher is going to exhort us to look at Christ with eyes of faith. And then consider the implication of what does our confession of faith imply? So the things we were taught in confirmation, the instruction we received after we were baptized, if we were baptized as older, older people, not children. So basically what you've been instructed in in the faith, what does that confession of faith imply? And then verse 2 is great. Because the preacher is also instructing the congregation to see Jesus as faithful. So verse 2 again says, talking about Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. And the neat thing about the original language there uh, is uh, uh, anto is the word. But the word anto is a what they call the theological present tense. And what theological present tense is, is Jesus is faithful, he is being faithful, and continues to be faithful. So it's, a, it's an active, it's going on right now, and it will continue to go on forever. Uh, so if you say, uh, God is faithful, he is faithful now, he will remain, continue to be faithful. It's unchanging. So that that construction is used uh, in scripture, usually to refer to God, something God is doing or something God does for us to show it didn't just happen when it happened. It's an ongoing happening. 
So you are, for example, when you were baptized, you were crucified with Christ, your old human nature died, the new creation rose from the water, and that happened to you on a day in history, but it continues to happen to you every day. It's ongoing. So that if you say you are uh, regenerated by water in the word, that regeneration didn't just happen at a fixed point in time, it continues to happen. These benefits God gives us are constant, ongoing, and unchanging. So when you see when you see a description of God and it's in the present tense, it's usually that's the actual tense in the original language, which is this theological present, meaning it continues to do so. Uh, and that's a call for us to focus these eyes of faith we're going to be using. Uh, in the presence of Jesus is our high priest in the divine service, so in worship. A lot of what's going on in Hebrews is referring to what happens in worship, in the community of the faithful. Okay, and we have Jesus' faithfulness being portrayed by two allusions from the Old Testament. Uh, the first was from 1 Samuel 2.35. And the second will be in Numbers 12. First Samuel 2.35, I think. Uh, just 235, I think, should be enough. I have chosen someone else to be my priest, someone who will always be faithful and obey me. I will always let his family serve as priests and help my chosen king. Okay. All right, so now a new priestly, fam priestly family is stepping in because Solomon deposed uh, Abba, uh, what's his name? Abba. Absalom? No, Abba, Ab. Well, anyway, whoever was the old priest, he got replaced with Zadok. Uh, so that's what this is referring to. And that was actually prophesied in Psalm 110 and also in Zechariah 6, 11 to 13, if you want to look that up uh, on your own. So God needs a new high priest. A new high priest is appointed. Uh, and that is going to point forward to um, Jesus becoming the faithful high priest over all uh, in the future. So, of course, Jesus is going to be a far greater high priest than, of course, Zadok, who's just a man. And then also that all the people are Jesus's brothers. We'll, we'll get that in chapter 3. We'll see more how not only is he our great high priest, but we are also his brothers. And you can look at Numbers chapter 12. For a little bit more of that, but we have to read a little bit more of it. So, Numbers 12 says, uh, And Miriam and Aram spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Has he not spoken also? By us, and the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spoke suddenly unto Moses, and unto Aaron, and unto Miriam, Come out, you three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud, and flood, no, oh, I'm sorry, and stood, it's got long S's, so <laughs> I keep saying F when it's an S and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all my house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches and the similitude of the Lord shall be beheld. Wherefore, 
then were not you afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, he was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us wherein we have done foolishly, and whereupon we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be thus uh, put out from the camp seven days, and after that let her be received in again. And Miriam was sent out from the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. And afterward the people removed from Hazaroth and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. Okay, so how is, for example, Moses different from all the other spokesmen of the Lord? He was visited by God. Right. So he was going to speak to God face to face. We saw that in uh, when he was on the mountain, right? He came down and his face was all glow, so he put a veil uh, over his face. And then we kind of see, okay, now we're getting hint transfiguration feelings, right? Because you have this Moses on the mountaintop, saw God, and he's all glowy. Okay? So then... That phrase, in all his house, can be taken two different ways. So you can think of, you know, he was the most faithful in all of God's house. So you could take it as being the tabernacle, because that's God's house. That's where God comes in the glory cloud to dwell with his people. Or you could take it as the people being God's household. So which should it be? Well, the writer to the Hebrews is alluding to that. And as he does, as he does throughout the book, there's two ways you can take something. He takes it both ways simultaneously. So there's no doubt. So we'll think about Moses being the most faithful of the people who work in the tabernacle and the most faithful of the community of God's people. And just keep that in mind because then we'll talk about how we are in the community of God's people in the church. And can that be taken two ways? Because that's a big difference. Big difference is Moses was actually able to see God and speak to him mouth to mouth, as it were. It's interesting that Moses, I mean, Aaron asked Moses to uh, not to lay the sin on them. Mm-hmm. Instead, instead of, you know, I mean, he was there, he and, he, he and God had had, had a, a personal relationship. Mm-hmm. But he, uh, when she became leprous, he didn't, he went to Mo, he turned to Moses, he didn't uh, pray directly to God. He kind of backtracked, didn't he? He's like, oh, I need an intercessor. <laughs> I maybe shouldn't go direct, right? Because that tends to not end so well for people. Yeah, that's interesting. And that's kind of what I got out of it, is like he doesn't dare speak to God directly about this. He goes through Moses because that's who Moses. That's what, why Moses is there, right? That's the that's what I get out of that. Well, especially after he had said that, uh, you know, that he had, had he not, God not spoke to him and Mary also. Mm-hmm. But you know, when the rubber meets the road, something just changed, Moses, and right? It's a whole different story. Yeah, so something just changed. Yeah, and you see that. And, that, and that's the only the only indication that something changed is Aaron does that. So, is that one hundred percent really what's going on? Maybe I don't know, but that that's what I read into it. Is that yeah? Aaron knows. Okay, he's got to go through. He's got to go through Moses. Moses is God's spokesperson. Yeah, I have something about Aaron anyway, <laughs> and it would just. I got into that more so than I got into Hebrews and mm. came with the golden calf and all that, you know. But nonetheless, that, that's another form. Oh yeah. Study. <laughs> okay. One of the other differences, now one of the differences between Christ and Moses. Okay, Moses doesn't furnish God's house. God furnishes God's house, right? So Moses was glorified more than any other person ever till Jesus comes. When you think about it. 
you know, he was held in pretty high esteem. But he doesn't, he does not build the house. He just works in the house that God told them how to make. But then, Job. hmm? What about Job? Well, yeah, there's Job too. Job's a whole nother, whole nother subject. I mean, he was, we do hear the same words, mm -hmm. you know, Right, so Christ is the builder, the furnisher, and the ruler of all things in this world and in the world to come. We know that. So that going back to Hebrews, we look at verses 3 and 4 there, chapter 3. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than even Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he that built all things is God. So he even says, yeah, Mo Moses was pretty glorious, but, you know, Christ, way more glorious. And Moses bore faithful witness, right? So he bore faithful witness in the Old Testament. He was, you know, he, he proclaimed God, right? He was, he was a faithful spokesman then. But then Moses is also still a faithful witness and spokesman to us now. Now, how is that? Look at Hebrews 11.23 and following. Right, we hear this, we hear this uh, section in church also. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, chuffing rather to, fuller, uh, to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians a saying to do, but were drowned. And then by faith, it talks about the walls of Jericho. So Moses did all those faithful things. So we just said Moses was a faithful witness then. So how is he a faithful witness now? How is he a faithful witness to us now? Moses? Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. He's not, but Jesus is. Mm. Not necessarily. Okay. We are looking forward to them to say something. You know, almost. Mm -hmm. He was like looking forward to the Messiah. Yep, that is also true. Um, wherefore, seeing we also are. Compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. That's Hebrews 13.1. So we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, of which Moses is one of those witnesses. We have scripture. The um, stiff neckedness, I guess, that Moses had the obstinance of the people that he had to lead, and still he did not. He was faithful to what God had sent him to do. Uh -huh. In I'm not saying very well. In spite of the opposition, I guess is right. And right, and we're going to talk about hard-heartedness a little bit later on in chapter three. We might get it to tonight yet, but but yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we're surrounded by this cloud of witnesses of which Moses is one of those witnesses to us of what being faithful looks like. And then not to belabor it anymore, but who are the two witnesses on the Mount of Transfiguration? Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses, right. So 
So even then, even here in the New Testament era, he is acting as, as a witness along with Elijah. So you have the law and the prophets testifying, this is my beloved son, listen to him, right? So. It's always also interesting that as faithful as he was, he never got to the promised land. Nope, he did not. <laughs> no, he did not. Instead of the rock, he hit the rock. And you could see it, but you couldn't go in. Yeah, and I mean, you know, when you, like the first time when you're a kid and you read that story, or maybe even when you're an adult, you just look at it and go, is that fair? That's not fair. I mean, <laughs> come on, Moses is a pretty righteous guy compared to the rest of us, and he didn't even get that. But that's the point. Yeah, Moses was a pretty righteous guy, and even he wasn't good enough to get there on his own. All right, so Moses was a great guy, and he couldn't enter the promised land. What makes you think you're worthy? Oh, I'm not only by grace through Christ. So yeah, I think that's why a lot of those, I mean, other than the fact they're sinners, I think that's a lot of the reason why some of those Old Testament patriarchs, which, yeah, they're pretty amazing guys, and then when you get right down to it, they're pretty sinful guys too. You know, it's not that, well, we hold them up on a pedestal because they're the patriarchs, and we sometimes forget some of the horrible stuff they did. Look at David. I mean, we love King David, and David was awful. I mean, David did some awful, awful stuff. And that's the point, as the point is, remember, you are a sinner too, just like David was. took him a while to get the point, but he got it, right? David asked for forgiveness. He did. And a lot of the other people did not. That's true. That's true. Well, he had to be shown that he had to ask for forgiveness, yeah. didn't he? He had Nathan. Nathan. Well, yes. But, he, but yes, he did. He did um, respect that. Yes. Follow through, where many of the other... Big name people didn't follow. Oh, but yeah, they were just awful, period. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Do you think David would have recognized what he did if Nathan hadn't come in and told him that story? I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure. I, I would lean to probably not. Probably he never would have said, oh, yeah, well, you know, I just did this thing. I mean, maybe he would have had a guilty conscience. I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. I mean, we look at it and go, that's a pretty outlandish plan he had. I mean, that's, really, that's, okay. Okay. So we have this great cloud of witnesses that witness to Christ. And then in verse 6, something new happens. And that one, this might be a little tougher uh, to notice. But in verse 6, it says, But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end? Okay, let's look at a couple other times when the title Christ is used. Look at someone do, Emily, you do Mark fourteen sixty one. Beth do Acts 2.36. And then you guys do Acts 10.36. And then let's see. Uh, Art do Revelation 11.15. And Ina do Revelation 12.10. 12, 12.10? 12, Revelation 12.10. Oh, you just... The last uh, verse six mm -hmm. that you were read in, uh, this is Max Lucado's thing, but it switched two words. It reads, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, mm -hmm. if we hold fast uh, the confidence and rejoicing in the uh, firm hope of the to the end. And I think your traffic is in whose... It's an, it's the, it says the same thing, but it's an archaic construction because it's oh, okay. really old King James. Yeah, Christ is a son over his own house. Whose house are we? Yeah, Not question mark, yeah. but okay. whose house we are. Yeah. Okay, okay. And I, I forgot to say, but the whole lady. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm actually rendering it in more modern English on the fly because this is, this is like really, this is like original King James, which is okay. not quite modern English yet. It's really weird, but it's fun to read. This is like a, this is actually a stepping stone between 
the early modern English and our modern English, so it's not as bad as the, if you read the original, original King James 16, whatever it is, it's almost unreadable because it's, it's that different English. Yeah, so Mark 1461, got it? Yeah, mine was 1210. Mine was 1210? 1210, yes. Okay. Okay. But Jesus kept quiet and did not say a word. The high priest asked him another question. Are you the Messiah, the son of the glorious God? Translation is that? I don't know. Oh. Contemporary English version. Oh. Oh. All right. That's all right. Go, who's got, uh, what is it, Acts 236? Sorry. I think they changed the word. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you've crucified. Okay. Very good. This is uh, Acts 10.36. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know the message that God has sent to the people of Israel is the good news that peace has come through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Lord of all people. Okay. What does your say? But Jesus kept quiet and did not say a word. The high priest asked him another question. Are you the Messiah, the son of the glorious God? Okay. What should it say? That's nah, fine. Messiah and Christ are the same thing. It's fine. It's not that different. All right. And then Art? Yeah, 1115. Mm -hmm. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet. There were loud voices in heaven, which said, "The kingdom of the world, <clears throat> the kingdom of the world, has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever." Okay, good. That's right in the Messiah. Yeah. I am so amazed yeah. at how many verses Handel must have really known his Bible well. Mm -hmm. to have picked out all those verses to put together that Messiah. I marvel it. And a little side note concerning Handel. He did 22 days. I know, and he was and only he like... Stroke. He was only like 23 years old. He had a stroke. He had a stroke from writing that? No, before. Oh, before. Well, I had not heard that. I didn't know that. Wow. Okay, Ina, do you have 1210? Uh, Revelation 1210. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, of his Christ, hmm, have come to the accuser of our brother, who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Okay. Okay, who's the accuser? Satan. Satan, right. He's the one that was cast out. So you can no longer, no longer stand as our accuser, our uh, attorney for the prosecution. Technically, is what that, what Satan really means. That's what's so great about Job. Speaking of Job, is like here's here's the devil arguing with God, and devil says, "Yeah, I can make him. You know, if you let me, I can make him curse your name." God's like, "Yeah, okay, go for it." And Job doesn't break. Job doesn't break, Job doesn't break. And all of a sudden, the devil just disappears. It's like one third of the way through the story, you never hear from the devil because, like, yeah, I lost him out. You never hear from him again. Like, what happened to the devil? He's gone. I, I love that. Okay, so in all of these things, we're hearing, you know, Jesus called the Christ, the anointed one, in reference to what role? So is he... He's... he's Particularly, 11, read eleven. Read Revelation eleven fifteen again. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were and there were loud voices in heaven which said, "The kingdom of the world has become has become the kingdom of our Lord 
and of his Christ. Okay, the kingdom of the what? No, the kingdom of our Lord. No, kingdom of the of the what before that? It's become the kingdom of our Lord, but it's the kingdom of what? The kingdom of the world. Kingdom of the world. Kingdom of the world, it's right. Become. Okay, so he's talking about the Christ being used as a title for the anointed one of God as a king. Basically, what all these verses have in common, it's talking about the Christ as a king. Now, for the first time, we see here in verse 6, the use of Christ as the title for God's anointed priest. This, this is a different, different way of talking about the anointed one. You know, so you have all these other places in the Bible that talks about the Christ being the king. Now he is God's anointed priest. So he's both our priest and king. So what does that say exactly? But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast to the confidence and the rejoicing and the hope firm to the end. Okay. So uh, the word Christ, excuse me, what is the root word for Christ? And what, what's Christos. Okay. And just what does that mean? Messiah. Okay. Yeah, and, so so it, uh, Christos is directly from the Hebrew Messiah, okay. which means anointed one, literally anointed one. Okay. So when we read this and it says his Christ, his mm-hmm. capital H. His anointed Christ, one. Amen. Okay, so that's his, the one that he appointed. Okay. Uh, yeah, Christ is a title. Exactly. You know, so if you, just like king. So if you said, okay, he is his, like if you have, um, you, you had all, all the uh, territorial, what do you call them, provinces of the Roman Empire. So under the emperor would be kings mm-hmm. of their own lands, but they all kicked up to Rome. They're all part of the empire. So they, he was the king of the, Roman Emperor. It just, it's, it's the same way. It's a title, so it is the it is God's Christ, God's anointed one. That's that's it's almost like the, if you want to misread it, it can be two different people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So so even and that's why Paul often has Christ Jesus instead of Jesus Christ because I mean technically when you say King David, you say King David. You don't say David King. Uh, so Christ Jesus, it's actually his title and his name. But the weird thing about Greek is it doesn't matter what order you put words in. So you could put Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter. It means exactly the same thing. It's not like English where you have well, to. We know that. But yeah. I guess somebody reading this, they think of his, well, if he's his Christ, yeah. you know, it, it, but none of this. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. So regardless of whether the title is referring to a king or a priest, what it is is. Uh, just like all of Israel's high priests and kings who were anointed to that office, Jesus is the one who was anointed by God to be both his priest and king. And therefore, when you're anointed by the king or anointed by God, you are authorized to speak on his behalf. Right. So Jesus speaking on behalf of the father, of course, they're all God, so it gets confusing when we talk about him like that. Uh, but Jesus is how God interacts with man you know, through his incarnation. So Jesus has the authority, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Jesus is allowed to deputize, if you want to call it that. So he is able to say, okay, you 12 guys, this is what you're going to do. And it gets them ready to go out, spread the gospel to the world. Uh, just like the high priests of old used to make new priests. That's how you made new priests. Same thing today. How do we make new pastors? Well, this president comes and he puts his hand on you. Then that's how they make new pastors through ordination or, or whoever does it. Uh, it's the same thing that's been going on since day one. So you have that laying out of hands to make new priests. You have the laying out of hands for coronation for a new monarch also. Okay, but... Again, Jesus is different. So this is what this author of the Hebrews, the preacher, is always going to be trying to show us is that, yeah, you have all these guys in the Old Testament that we're going to talk about because you're familiar with them. But now there's this Jesus, the Lord's Christ, and he is better than all those guys because 
look at this. So you have all those fellows in the Old Testament, right? Moses picked by God to anoint priests. So you uh, would give, anoint them with the holy oil in Exodus chapter 30, uh, and they would make new priests to take care of the tabernacle, right? But Jesus wasn't anointed by Moses or by another prophet or by another priest, as it happened in those days. He was, he was anointed, the anointing, the holy one, the anointed one of God. Who is he anointed by? And it's not John the Baptist. He just baptized him. But it was the same day. So who, who was Jesus anointed by? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, right. So John said that he saw the Holy Spirit descend and remain on him like a dove. So yes, that happened right there at his baptism. And uh, the writer of the Hebrews even pointed that out to us in chapter 1, verse 9. Uh, let's see. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows, referring to, to Jesus. Okay, and then Acts 10.37 also speaks to that. So Acts 10.37 says, You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Okay, so even... Even Luke records that, hey, you yourself saw, this is where it started. It started at Jesus' baptism where he's anointed with the Holy Spirit and then it spread from there. Okay, so another difference is that Jesus did not become God's son by adoption uh, at his anointing, which happens with other types of anointing. Uh, you can look at uh, 2 Samuel uh, 7, for example. Let's see here. 2 Samuel 7, verse 12 says, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son when he commits iniquity. I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not uh, depart from him. Okay, so that's just talking about raising up new, new folks. Uh, so they're not actually sons of God, they're adopted. Um, but Jesus, of course, is different. He was not ever adopted. He was from eternally the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds. Right? So he has always been the Son. Eternally has been the Son. So not adopted, but just is. Just is. Uh, so that in that way, he is also greater than all the kings and priests that have come before uh, and also God's house belongs to him, uh, which we also got that from the preacher, the very first chapter of Hebrews. And that's all well and good. We all know this stuff. It's like, okay, you haven't really told us anything we don't know. This is true. Uh, but that's the preacher's point. He's making very explicit, you know, talking about God's son in this way. I forgot what I was going to say. What was I going to say? I hate when that happens. Um, yeah, he's anointed as God's royal priest because he's already God's eternal son and his son and his house already belongs to him. So now we have to ask the question, what's God's house? Where is God's house? What is it? Because if Jesus is the Christ over God's house, we have to know what God's house is. The church. It is the church. So is it... Not this place? The church of all believers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not only, it's actually both. We have to go back to like mm -hmm. we were talking about earlier. You know, so is it 
Is it the congregation, the people, or is it the congregation of the people in this place? And the answer is yes. It is both the church physical and the people who are the members of the church. Uh, I don't think it really matters that much about the place other than the place is consecrated to be this place. It's still just a building, uh, but it is the place set apart for, for use, for God's use to deliver his gifts. I mean, just like the tabernacle, that is the place where God came to dwell. So that was a special place, right? They built it, they carried it around with them. They set it back up, but it was still, they wouldn't have just said it's, you know, the tent, you know, it's, no, that's the tabernacle, right? You would, you wouldn't say, okay, well, yeah, we're just going to go, we're just going to go in there, go to church. I mean, it's like, no, that's the church where you have all the appointments and all the stuff we do, the special things we have, uh, because we make it special because that's where God says he is. So if God says that's where he is, we should give him a nice house, the best that we can. I agree. But now does that mean... We don't always do that. No, we don't always do that. Now does that mean when those Lutherans in Russia who didn't have a church and they could only meet in a barber shop. Does that mean that barber shop was holy ground? Yeah, at the time. Because that's all they had to work with. And they didn't uh, didn't have too many appointments. Haha, <laughs> get it, it's a barber shop. Joke, that was funny. All right, so what they had to actually do is they just threw like the, the, these drapes over the barber chairs and over all the tools and everything, and they'd set up a little cross and a couple candlesticks because that's all they had. But it worked, and that little church eventually grew, and they eventually got out of the barber shop and got themselves a little place to have church, and that's the end of the story. I don't know anything else about it. But at that time, you know, did, did Christ come to dwell in that barber shop? Well, yeah, his word and sacraments were being administered according to his institution. So, yes, that was holy ground. So, yeah, we don't always think of it that way. But it is. It is what it is because we set it apart because God set it apart first. He said he's going to be wherever two or three are gathered. And that's where that happens. Okay, so God's house is both the place and the people. And that's the pastor and the people. And the important reason why I mentioned that is because not because you got to have a pastor, but you got to have sinners because Christ comes only for sinners. So it's all of us, all of us sinners that gather. That's what it's for. None of us above anybody else. Uh, we just have different jobs to do. Um, and we do that now and we will continue to do so. That's that theological present because that's what God promises to do wherever we gather and wherever his gospel is proclaimed, there he is, and he will always be there. Okay, so that ends that section. Really, I mean, yeah, it's come some neat things to think about, uh, but really, does that really does that really teach us anything? Well, no, but the point of this section was was again to compare Moses with Jesus to uh, compare Moses' faithfulness to Jesus' faithfulness. Jesus wins. The greater glory of Jesus as the one who actually furnishes God's house, who actually inhabits God's house. Again, fully out of the park, Jesus wins. Always Jesus is going to be greater. Uh, and also contrast Moses as the steward of God's house and Christ as steward over God's house and God's people. Well, isn't that something we should think about who he's talking to, why he's making this, these connections to the Old Testament? Because it's, it's the Hebrews he's talking to, so right. he's telling them what they now have in place of what they had before. Yeah, and, and he's telling them everything they already know because they already know all this stuff. Right. They know it very well, better than you and I know it. Uh, and then again, you have this, the last part of it is, is the end of that little section ends with this whole confessional self-affirmation of the congregation in God's house. So it's like, yeah, you, you have like synagogues, you have at this point, they still have the uh, temple, but you also have this new privileged status as children of God, as brothers with Christ, as he's going to get into. Uh, so you need to retain that privileged status. It's like, yeah, you had 
we had the tabernacle in the wilderness. We have the temple. Now we have Christ and where he comes to us with his gifts, which is in somebody's living room right now for them, right? But they still retain that privileged status of where they gather for the gifts. Their, their great high priest is going to be also. And now it's going to enter into the next section, which applies to us a little bit easier uh, because all those things are true and we just kind of take them for granted, I think. But now we're going to talk, now the preacher is going to give us a little law because he is a good Lutheran preacher, so there's going to be law and gospel. So he's established for us to remember how great Christ is and what he has done and that you're brothers with him and also priests with him but before you get too carried away, let's talk about unbelief, which is going to be the next section. And that's what kind of what I was talking about in our opening prayer about the only real sin Jesus ever preached about in the New Testament. He, he, he railed against the Pharisees for their hypocrisy, but the sin he convicted them of was unbelief. Always unbelief, unbelief. It's like, yes, we sin, but our biggest sin is our unbelief the, our, our lack of faith that, yes, he died for that, too. That's where the sin of unbelief comes in. So we're going to see a, a warning now. So starting in verse 7. Chapter 3, verse 7. So if someone would read, someone would read through Let's just somebody read seven to. You might as well read it all. Somebody read seven to the end, and I'll be, I'll be right back. And then we'll talk about some Old Testament stuff. Again. Hmm? Chapter three, verse seven. Yeah, Hebrews three, verses seven to the end of the chapter. There, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. In the days of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my work for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief, in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom has, was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because, they could not enter in because of unbelief. Like my translation, you know, it says that the, they they rebelled, but also that they were stubborn, and God got tired of them, <laughs> and, <laughs> and said, "You people never show good sense." <laughs> so it's a little more plain spoken than that. Is an entertaining translation, that's for sure. That puts it down front. Okay. What translation is that again? What's it called? Contemporary Christian. Okay. That's not wrong. Yeah, contemporary English, and it's supposed to be ch child friendly. I don't know if I'm coming or going. Okay, 95. Okay, so we're definitely getting a warning there in that first section. Uh, and as the Holy Spirit says, I, how many times in the Bible have you seen that phrase? Not a lot, I don't think. 
as the Holy Spirit says. And then it has a nice long quote from something. That would be Psalm, I think, 95. 95. So Psalm 95 says, uh, <clears throat> and this is one of the Psalms that doesn't have a superscription over it, so it doesn't say it's like a Psalm, a psalm of David or a song, a Psalm of the sons of Korah or anything like this. This is a, a section of the Psalms that was... Uh, Strictly for, not strictly, but basically uh, it was a public exhortation. So this is a public prayer or a public hymn. So Psalm 95, I'm going to read Robert Alter's translation because I, I love his Old Testament uh, translation. Robert Alter is a, a, a Jewish scholar, a Hebrew scholar. Uh, and his life's work was this translation of the Hebrew scriptures that he did. He's an interesting fellow because he uh, did his English translation to try to be uh, as like lyrically or musically close in his translation to the original as faithfully as he could and still make a readable translation, which is not an easy thing to do. And he's also a secular Jew. Uh, so you're not really going to see, you're absolutely, in his translation, Christ does not come ringing loud and clear because... He's Jewish and he's a secular Jew on top of it. But he treated it as epic literature, like Homer or something like that, which the doing it that way is an interesting take uh, because musically the way it comes through is really beautiful because we know everything in the Old Testament is about Christ. We don't need somebody to tell us that. So it's interesting to see a Hebrew scholar's take on the scriptures as epic literature, which it certainly is. It starts with the beginning of the world and ends with the end of the world. So how much more epic can you get? So Psalm 95 says, Come, let us sing gladly to the Lord. Let us shout out the rock of our rescue. Let us greet him in acclaim in songs. Let us shout out to him. For a great God is the Lord and great king over all the gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth and the peaks of the mountains are his. His is the sea and he made it and the dry land his hands did fashion. Come, let us bow and kneel, bend the knee before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people he tends and the flock of his hand. If you would only heed his voice, do not harden your heart as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your forefathers tested me, tried me, though they had seen my acts. Forty years I loathed a generation, and I said, there are a people of wayward heart, and they did not know my ways. Against them I swore in my wrath. They shall not come to my resting place. That psalm took a turn, didn't it? Okay. So you hear the praise, our praise, okay, this is this is our, who our God is, and then God speaks, and it's like, well, yeah, whoop, yikes. Uh, does anybody know where that is in our liturgy, where we hear that song, psalm? I'm sure. Does anybody know where in our liturgy we hear almost word for word that psalm? Oh, yeah. Everybody remember? We have to remember back to like school, probably. That is matins. Yes, that was from matins. So that's in the big, the great hymn of praise at the beginning of matins. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. That one, yeah. Yeah, well, because we don't do weekday. Don't do weekday services anymore. We should do matins some Sunday when we don't have like the Lord's Supper or something. Everybody have to <laughs> dust that one off because I know most people know it, but it's been a while since we sang it. Okay, so we hear in this psalm uh, a warning, which is the warning that's actually quoted. None of the praise part is quoted, but that warning, that law comes straight through. Okay, so the preacher is reminding us where the Holy Spirit had before given us God's warning about what happens when you harden your heart like the Israelites and what his judgment for that was. So what was, what was that judgment? What happened? They never got to see the promised land. I mean, isn't that, they were barred from it, those of that generation. Right, so they all died. 
in the wilderness. So that's why they wandered for 40 years. Like, well, how did they get lost for 40 years? It's not that big a desert. Because they all had to die before the rest of them got to the Holy Land. Maybe it was a lousy GPS. Could have been. GPS doesn't work that good in the Middle East. Well, that's a punishment system here that has a stage reduction. Right. I mean, how bad is that going to be? When are we going to get there? And yet their shoes didn't wear out, their, their feet didn't swell, but they died. So, hmm. They must have died from old age then. Yeah, or something. It couldn't have been the food. No, not the food, that's for sure. Right. Okay. So then... So see what the preacher does? He gives us that warning. Hey, the Holy, the Holy Spirit says, remember from this cloud of witnesses we're surrounded by. Remember what happened to them when they were hard of heart. So take care, brothers. Let's be any of you has an evil or unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day not to do this. They probably died of boredom. Probably. Because if their clothes didn't wear out and their shoes didn't wear out, they didn't have to have those businesses. Right. And what did you do all day when you wandered? Walk. Didn't and have the YouTube. Food, they didn't have to prepare food. No. I mean, there just wasn't anything to do. And the desert doesn't lend itself to good gardening. Could you imagine how insufferable the kids would have been? Slap fight. <laughs> yeah, slap fight. That, maybe that's when slap fight was invented. Okay, so they... So the preacher gives us a warning. So we've heard the law, kind of. This is what's going to happen if you do this. And now he's going to apply that warning to us. And he gives us two lessons. So right there in verses 12 and 13 that I just read. So take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And there's a good quote here from Luther from the very first volume of his works, which I know is about his lectures on the Psalms. So that's the very first, one of the very first things he wrote professionally was his lectures on the books of Psalms. That was the first thing he taught at the University of Wittenberg. Uh, so he was, this is from his commentary on the Psalm we just read. And it says, we wretched men have lost that bliss of our physical life through sin. And while we live, we are in the midst of death. And yet, because the Sabbath command remains for the church, it denotes that spiritual life is to be restored to us through Christ. It's like, huh, what's that got to do with what we just read? So we should keep reading what we just read to understand what Luther's talking about. Because Luther usually has pretty good stuff to say. All right, so there's two things that we're supposed to apply to ourselves as the congregation from hearing this warning. Okay, that's part of the first part of the application. So we were given two instructions. What, what are the two instructions, two things we need to do? Don't harden our hearts. Right? Don't harden our hearts. And how do we do that? Encourage one another. Okay, that's the second instruction is to daily encourage one another to avoid that sinful deception. So the first thing must be to recognize the problem. Okay, so we've got to encourage each other to keep us from falling into unbelief. Well, the first thing we need then is insight to recognize it because we see the consequence of the unbelief. We, the consequence of unbelief is falling away. So before we do that, we need to be able to recognize uh, recognize falling away from uh, the living God, as the preacher calls it, leading you to fall away from the living God. Now, how many of you have been, ever been worried about falling away from the living God? Sure, at some time or another. But, but is that what we're really concerned about? I mean, yeah. no? Yeah. No. So... Must not be that big a deal because, wow, that sounds major. It's like, well, I mean, you're losing your faith for good. That's, I think I'd recognize if that was happening. And that's not true. It's a little bit. It's, uh, the, the one commentary I wrote, I wrote, one commentary I read said apostasy, which apostasy is 
is falling away from the faith. If you're an apostate, you are one who has left the faith. Uh, that's what they they call you in Islam. You know, apostasy means if you leave Islam, that's when they can go kill you because apostates must die. So apostasy doesn't usually begin an open rebellion. So it's not like, oh, I'm going to fall away from the faith. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to mm, pout and I'm going to rail against the stupid things you people are doing in church. How are you guys wasting your Sunday mornings with this? Don't, this is ridiculous. We don't need to do this. I'm going out and play golf. That's not how apostasy starts. It doesn't start at overtly with open rebellion. It starts internally with just little tiny things, like you said. So it's just a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And the next thing you know, you're sowing a, a bounty of unbelief. So, compromising. Yeah, compromising, and we see that. I mean, that actually is the apostasy that's happening in this country. We, we're starting to see. It didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen in the last administration. It didn't even happen in the last two decades. It's been happening probably since the foundation of this country. It's been happening in the world since Christ ascended into heaven in one form or another. These things go in waves, too, you can see in history. But the things we see going on, well, that's the compromises. That's when the church, who should know better, now I'm talking capital C church, all of us communally who are not watching necessarily out for each other. Now I'm going to soapbox a little bit, but I guess you've got to do that once in a while. You know, that is when we compromise the little things. So little things like, oh, well, you know, a woman can preach as well as a man. And that's probably true in some cases, but every church that has gone that route to women's ordination, the next thing you know, you have homosexual ordination, and then you have open acceptance of homosexual lifestyle, and that's just sexuality. And then we have, oh, and, and LBTGQ plus minus whatever. Uh, the transgender clergy, too, is a thing. As if that's not confusing enough. Uh, and that's just sexuality. We see what, what sexual, not even sexual sin, but sexual acceptance, I guess that's not the word I'm looking for, but uh, disregard of God's word, you know, disregard for God's order for creation. That's just one thing. And then we have uh, our daily language, too. And I mean, I'm as guilty of it. I, I probably listen to things I shouldn't listen to. But the things that are allowed on normal TV at normal time of day when children are watching is a far cry from what it used to be because we're being more and more permissive. And that's so easy for us to say, well, you know, it's not that bad. We should be discerning enough that we should be able to consume this kind of media without it poisoning us. But again, that's a compromise. And I'm, I'd be a hypocrite if said I don't do it. I mean, I, I listen to this stuff too. So I'm as guilty as the next person for allowing things. You know, that, that, that's what happens. And the next thing you know, there will be no words that are taboo, right? Just like there's no indecent behavior that's taboo. And in fact, it's not just not taboo. If you don't accept that as legitimate, you're the problem. You're the one who's now a bigot. Like, okay. You know, so it's the little things. And little things, little by little, society has allowed these things to be normal and are now acceptable. And now we've just trivialized, you know, a good chunk of the Ten Commandments. Uh, and we do the same thing with life before its beginning, you know, at its beginning and before its natural end. We've compromised on that. And now you see the genocide of the unborn and you see the outright murder of the elderly. It's happening all over the world because we've made compromises because, uh, well, you can't make those decisions for me. I should be able to choose that. And we as a community kind of went, yeah, okay. Because if we don't say anything, then we're as guilty. Silence means consent. We, we don't speak out. Oh, it's over there. Or another yeah. neighborhood. It's like, well, that's not happening in my country. Yeah, until yeah. it does. It's a live and let live kind of thing. And unfortunately, that is not a good slogan. To, yep. It's good to go by. Max yeah. Cato uh, here, if you don't mind, it's just one well, kind of interesting that in his introduction to Hebrews, he said, Hebrews, Hebrews was written for Jewish believers who were torn between their new faith and their old ways. 
The temptation was to slip back into familiar, familiar routines and rituals, settling for second best. And people thought, but that's kind of where we are. We get familiar with what we have, and mm -hmm. change is okay if, if we like it, if it fits our personality or fits our lifestyle. And if it doesn't, well, it's, it's not okay, but it, it, that, that's for them. And unfortunately, we forget many times that this, we are in a war. It's, it, this is just not, you know, the, the, we give Satan more more room than he should have. No, I mean, we do his job for him. <laughs> he doesn't have to work very hard anymore. That's, that's true. Who does Max say broke Hebrews, by the way? Just like, how does Who does Lucado say broke Hebrews? Does he mention it in his introduction? Who he thinks the author is? What's the name of it? I, I, I mean, who, who does, do, who does oh, that Lucado. say? Was, yeah, Lucado. Who... who who does he say the author of Hebrews is? Just curious. No, he doesn't. He doesn't? Good guy. Doesn't put a... Yeah. Put a well, it's kind of like what I did. I just said, okay, here's here's, six here's six. the five possibilities, and I think it's this guy, but there's this many, or six, whatever. So, yeah, and that, and that is what we do as a church body. You know, as even the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, for example, you know, we have... Our, you know, we have our stupid meetings every three years and they'll throw stuff on the floor. You know, oh yes, we'll reaffirm that marriage is between one man and one woman. We haven't compromised that yet. But then in our day to day, it's like, well, how do you handle this? Well, we got to be inclusive. You don't ever want it. It's like, well, okay. Yeah, that's not the same as, as compromising the commandments. The, the loving one another and then condoning what other people do is not the same thing. And we'd be hypocrites if we said so, because we condone all kinds of things that we shouldn't. Minor things, little white lies. Come on, who doesn't condone those? We do it. And lies don't come unconscious. You know, and that almost seems, it almost seems kind of stupid when you say it out loud. It's like, well, yeah, of course we tell little white lies. Are they okay? If you consistently drive five miles over the speed limit because you don't want to, why is everybody looking at me? If you consistently drive five miles an hour over the spin limit because you know no cop is going to pull you over for that, it's it's even though. That's it's really safe. <laughs> but. <laughs> But if you do that, knowing it's still breaking the law, is that a sin? And ever, most people go, well, no, because you're, you're in the wiggle room. But uh, is it? Okay, because that's the dumbest example. But is it? Is it? Yeah, it is. Technically, you're breaking the law. Is, the cop, is no cop ever going to pull you over for it? Probably not. It doesn't make it right. Okay. Jesus doesn't give you any wiggle room. Yeah, there is no wiggle room. It's like break one of my commandments and you're going to hell. That's pretty, pretty much it. But then as we will see, as we finish this section, which we'll do next week, as we finish this section, you know, we'll see that, oh, the real sin here, and sin is still sin. Jesus isn't saying it's not a sin. He's saying he died for those. The big killer, our big killer is our doubt that he died for it, that we, he forgave us, that our unbelief, because every, you know, we can know that Jesus is the Son of God. We can know that he died on the cross for our sins. And you can still go to hell. Because guess what? The demons believe that. The demons know that. They have that knowledge. But they don't, they don't... We, if you have faith that he died for your sins, that's what gains you heaven. And the demons can't do that. Uh, yeah. So that's where we will uh, continue next week. So we see, we see the consequence of unbelief. We know we need to be alert to it, not only individually, but for each other. And as a church, capital C, as the saints gathered in this place, we need to be aware of it because the penalty for compromise is devastating. So that's where we'll head next week. And we will also talk a little bit about the doctrine of good works and the doctrine of election. And we'll do that in the book of Concord next week. So one of our confessional documents. Well, actually, I think I'll bring the good one instead of that one. But, Is the uh, translation different? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, wow. And I like, th because the footnotes are helpful and a good one too. Uh, so we'll be in the formula of Concord, the solid declaration uh, next week. Briefly, we're not going to get into a whole lot of it. And then we will continue... Uh, looking at Israel's example, the people of Israel's example of what not to do and how to avoid that. 
Great. Was anybody following along with Psalm 95 by chance when I was reading this translation? Sure. Was anybody following along to Psalm 95 when I was reading? How did it sound? Did track pretty close? Pretty close. Okay. But then I have a Max Cicado by Okay, there we go. Uh, we sang in <laughs> Yeah, I like his, he has, he doesn't have a lot of footnotes in his translation, but the ones there are, are ones you won't find anywhere else because of the, the way he's doing it. So, uh, so it's kind of neat. All right. If there's no questions or discussion, that's where we'll end for this week. One last thing for Max Cato's introduction. Sure. <laughs> I love the way he writes him. Um, the author skillfully makes a case against, uh, well, the, the, the digression of, Selling the second best. He argued that Jesus is better than any form of the old faith. Mm -hmm. Better than the angels, better than their leaders, better than their priests. And when it comes to comparing the two, there is simply no comparison because Christianity has a better covenant, a better sanctuary, and a better sacrifice for sin. It's not that the old law was bad, it's just that the new law, salvation by faith in Christ, is better. So once you've known the best, why sell for second rate? That's not wrong. Right. I, mean, I mean, that was the. I mean, that was Peter's big obstacle at first too. Was he wanted to? He wanted to have everything he was raised with, even though he believed. I mean, he was a witness to so many things, but yet he wanted to cling to all those traditions, and that was going to be a hindrance for him to witness to the Gentiles, which is why he had to have that dream with all the stuff on the blanket three times. Right? Peter rides, kill and eat, uh, so that he could go with confidence into that Gentile's house, sit down, have a meal with them, and talk about Jesus. But that was going to be the stumbling block for him delivering the gospel because he could not let that stuff go. Um, so he eventually does. Spoiler alert. Plus he got to eat bacon. Bacon's good. Right. All right. We'll end there. Let's uh, close tonight with the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.